please welcome Minas. Um, I'm going to uh, first of all thank the organizers, thanks uh, Stuart and Dave for invitation. Um, and in full disclosure, I will say that uh, I'm a physicist, I'm a scientist, and uh, I dabble in the metaphysical. Okay, so in fact, we can be very successful scientists and um, pursue other forms of knowledge, as I think um, um, the previous speaker, uh, Len, just indicated. Uh, it would be an interesting conference if instead of having um, a juxtaposition between science and metaphysics, it was, uh, it was a juxtaposition between science and art. That would be a different kind of audience, a different kind uh, of, um, of arguments. And I would still be here because I actually love art and I, I, I do art. So um, in a way, I, I sort of uh, don't like to be put in a category. Uh, so this category of being spiritual, I would say that uh, I'm a scientist. I do quite a good science. And uh, I pursue the limits of science. And this is really what is uh, what it's all about: is how can we pursue the limits of science? Of course, um, uh, I will take exception to a couple of points that uh, Len just mentioned. Um, Archimedes was not just an engineer who was the greatest uh, ancient uh, scientist of all times. Uh, he founded, of course, a number of principles, uh, and also uh, through mathematical reasoning and to a certain extent uh, uh, pure intuition, I would say, actually ended up calculating the number of particles that could fit in the universe, in the observable universe of those times, which was the Ptolemaic system extended by Aristarchus of Samos. And he got the number 10 to the 80 particles if you translated these grains of sand to atoms in a modern way, which happens to be actually Eddington's number, it happens to be the correct number for the number of particles in the universe. So this is a, a little bit um, strange, and uh, it is true that scientists who use uh, pure reason and use mathematics, but at the same time, we use intuition, and of course, Einstein was well known for that, and all the great quantum physicists. So we have to uh, make sure that we don't go too much on the one side and too much on the other side. That's, that would be my main message. Um, I don't know how to do this, but I'm only a theoretical physicist, so. Okay, here we are. So uh, I have a lot of slides, and um, uh, I may go fast with some of them. The issue of consciousness versus brain function. Quite often, um, we try to identify the two as identical. I would say the one is the same. And of course, again, through the great and long work of uh, Dave, um, shown that they're not the same. Uh, they, are the, they are the physical correlates that correspond to states of the brain, uh, which, of course, um, seem to be lighting up or react to, to stimuli, but they're not the same. They're not identical. Um, the view of um, the world according to classical physics is, um, uh, this is from one of my books, um, is uh, a wall. You have Isaac Newton looking. And by the way, Isaac Newton, if he, if he was um, uh, live today, he would not be a Newtonian. He would, be, he would take a lot of exceptions with the Newtonian view of the universe. But basically, you have a clockwork universe. You have a universe that is ticking away, um, that was set up uh, in some sort of divine order, perhaps. And in fact, I, uh, Newton himself believed that there was a divine order that set the whole thing going. And uh, then the observer is just um, sitting on the outside, th looking through this, um, um, through this uh, uh, wall of uh, glass um, peering behind everything that is directly accessible to him. Through the mathematical reasoning and um, the discovering the laws of uh, physics, what we now call the laws of physics. Well, um, the problem with this view is that uh, it really has no room for conscious observers. And um, uh, the classical view versus the quantum view are completely, completely different. And it is um, um, a strange uh, dilemma that uh, we scientists find ourselves that we practice science in a very useful and determined, well determined way, publishing articles, getting grants and all of that. And at the same time, we seem to not ask what are the foundations of the way we do science? 
So in fact, in the conscious universe, I actually did not end up embracing spirituality. Um, I ended up um, with my co-author, um, Bob Nadeau, saying that the quantum theory opened the door to consciousness. And therefore, it, it fulfilled a very, very important reason. It opened the door. However, it did not solve the problem of consciousness. But it is a very, very important step, because in the, in the classical uh, physics, there's just no such thing. They completely ignore. Um, so again, it opened the door to the issue of consciousness. But the underlying subjective experience cannot be studied as an object. And therefore, the usual tools and methods of current science don't directly apply. The word directly is very important here. And I think this is, of course, where uh, Dave comes in. And um, with uh, the work uh, of the qualia to try to address this very, very issue that we're talking about. So indirectly, it applies, but not directly. The quantum world is strange, but it is the world. It is the real world. And I will leave aside the world real, um, because that will take another uh, set of meetings and things like this. Uh, but let's say by reality, it means something that exists, OK? So let's leave it at that. The quantum world is strange in the sense that it allows for complementary aspects of reality, which the human mind rejects. Because says, how can something be a particle and a wave? Well, folks, it's not a particle and a wave at the same time under the same conditions. It is depending on the contextuality, what we call in quantum physics the contextual setup of the experiments. So it will, an electron behaves until it's observed as a wave of possibilities that upon observation collapse, and hence the term collapse of the wave function, into specific space time events that can be recorded, either in a photographic plate in the older days. Of course, today we're more advanced in photographic plates. It will be electronic devices that record a particular signal. So the principle of complementarity, which was sort of obscure and was put forward by Niels Bohr is a very important part of the quantum world. The human mind rejects the possibility of having opposites assigned to the same entity. Because the human mind works that way. The human brain, perhaps, is built that way. The hardware is built that way. We've got to start thinking about that. Before we make these great theories about everything that we don't know, let's look at the hardware itself. It is the left lobe and the right lobe. And I'm not a neuroscientist. I also dabble in neuroscience a little bit. But it is true that the two halves of the brain seem to be at war with each other. It is as at least two beings are inside our skull. And fortunately, there is a corpus callosum that tries to connect them. And there are interesting things happen when, of course, the corpus callosum is um, severed. So the dilemma is not that the world is quantum. The dilemma is, why are we perceiving an either or situation without possibility of something that is both? A particle can be a wave. A wave can be a particle. This is the famous two-hole experiment, as Richard Feynman would put it, where you have a source of quanta going through an opening, and then a second opening. And if you have this contextual setup, you get the wave properties. If, on the other hand, you would say, well, this is not satisfactory. I want to know exactly through which opening it went through, and you put a detector, a photon detector, which goes click every time a, part, a photon goes through, the pattern completely dis disappears. Is it the same? Can you say, well, how can it be the same? 
there are different situations. Bohr would say it's a different setup. I already talked about the collapse of the wave function. The, the aspect experiment, an interesting part of quantum theory is non-locality. Two entities, two quanta that are brought together at the beginning in a particular quantum state. When they get separated, they fly apart. And then, in fact, at the last nanosecond, you make a choice to observe a particular variable, let's say polarization, and get a particular direction of polarization. The other quantum, which is tied to it, and it can be at the edge of the universe, responds by getting a particular value as determined by the combined state of the quantum state of the system. However, in linear Schrodinger equation, in linear quantum theory, you cannot send signals that way. There are some recent developments of nonlinear Schrodinger equation, which are actually very interesting, that perhaps have some implication for consciousness um, because of coherence through the noise and all of that, that perhaps may give us a new way of looking at uh, future developments of the quantum theory. This uh, experiment was performed by Aspect. In fact, it is um, the experimental verification of uh, Bell's theorem. Um, Bell himself set up these inequalities because he wanted to, in fact, he wanted to disprove quantum theory. He didn't believe that you could have these faster than light correlations. But being a good physicist, he said, yeah, in the end, it was the way it was. Another strange aspect of quantum theory is delayed choice experiment. Uh, it was proposed by various people, but perhaps more uh, eloquently put together by John Archibald Wheeler. Basically, you can sort of decide after the photon has gone through the two openings whether to open the second um, apparatus over here in the form of Venetian blind and or close it. And this experiment has been performed. And if you do one choice, you do a yes or no. If you get yes, you will get the quantum uh, particle view of the, of, the, of the photon. If you do a no, you get the wave. But how can that be since the photon has already gone through the two openings? So there's a mixture of past and present. However, to just jump and say that there is retrocausality, it's a little bit, we have to be a little bit careful about that. And there's another discussion we can have a long time over this issue of uh, correlation of uh, temporal behavior. At plant scales, things break down because space-time itself breaks down. And so far, attempts to combine quantum theory and general relativity have failed. I will agree with Land that I'm not embarrassed that uh, we don't have answers to certain deep questions. One of the most embarrassing questions, besides the, the question of consciousness, is how come the two most successful physical theories we have, general relativity and quantum theory, stubbornly refuse to be combined? There may be some nonlinearities, there may be some things like that, but to this point, we don't have it. We have what um, uh, is known, of course, as the string theory, and, uh, uh, but it's so far that is moving into the realm of not, we're not able to, to really uh, measure it in any, in any meaningful way. And therefore, it remains in the realm, if you like, of, um, of uh, mathematical speculation, which is fine for the time being. Um, by the way, uh, the atoms don't exist, and Aristotle was right. <laughs> Uh, or maybe Democritus and Aristotle were both right. Again, a complementarity. Because, of course, uh, below the atoms you have the particles, below the particles you have the individual, um, the individual particles, and eventually everything gets res uh, resolved into the superstrings, and beyond the superstrings is the quantum form, and there are no particles. So in some ways, they're both right. And of course, the atomic theory is correct, where, it's, where it is applied, but it's not applying at all the way down to the Planck length. Um, no one says that Aristotle didn't mean the force. He called them atoms. He, he called them atoms. Yeah, so in those days, 
as Archimedes in fact was trying to find out what they meant by atoms was the smallest thing looking like a grain of sand, which of course today we know is not the case. Um, my own approach, and I will um, probably, um, I don't know how much time I have, I guess, uh, less, than less than five minutes, I will um, talk a little bit about um, a way to push forward, perhaps, is um, to come up with what I call foundational principles. Um, in other words, push all the way to the Planck dimensions and beyond. The problem when you push all the way to the Planck dimensions and beyond is that you're pushing beyond space and time. And then all hell breaks loose, so to speak. <laughs> okay? Then science, as it is practiced today, cannot be done. However, I will not reject science. I would say that what we need to do and here I would agree with uh, uh, Deepak very much, is we need to revise science. And by the way, science is being revised all the time. I don't quite understand why some scientists are so orthodox, you know, uh, that they, anything that sort of um, they perceive uh, is threatening to the faith. Reminds you of Middle Ages, right? At that time, they used to burn the heretics. Anything that sort of smacks of you know, going against the faith, they will rise up and defend it. I think we have to go beyond that to realize that uh, we, all scientists, are skeptics, but not hopelessly skeptics. In other words, not, not in a way that we reject anything that does not fit in our own little box of reality. So my own attempt to perhaps go beyond all of this is to come up with universal principles which should ultimately be mathematical in origin. They should be derived by mathematics. There's something deep about mathematics, and I would agree on this very much with uh, Spinoza and Einstein, and of course, uh, Pythagoras and all the great ancient uh, uh, philosophers of the West. So these principles perhaps manifest in the quantum realm, and if you start going through them, they are perhaps characteristics of consciousness. So for me, rather than trying to define consciousness as an object of study, perhaps we should try to understand its properties through these principles. It may not be satisfactory, but it is as far as it will push the limit. And I will wrap it up. The complementarity in biology, for example, I will just tell you a couple of things about complementarity because I still believe it is a very, very deep principle. And now it seems that it's applied to biology. There are biologists coming forward and are pushing for bio my own collaborator, uh, Neil Tice, I hope he's in the audience, myself, we're working on the idea of extending complementarity to biology. By the way, Niels Bohr himself had done that. Here is a, a, a place where um, a limit, horizon, what like we call horizon of knowledge, um, allows something that looks like a finger to eventually become a fuzzy things of atoms coming out of the finger. Certainly at that level, it doesn't look anymore like a finger. And uh, finally, um, in terms of the evidence we have for quantum effects in the brain, it becoming more solid and solid. It still does not tell us exactly how quantum theory would account for consciousness, and I would probably say it will not. In terms of, in terms of the contemplative science of the East, and I will finish with that, they, it is a tremendously long existing system that has proven very successful for thousands of years. For us as scientists to reject it and say, well, it has nothing to do with the real world, I think it, it is, um, to say the least, premature or to take a very Western point of view. Um, because again, our Western basis of science, going back to the ancient Greeks, was really very much had both, both complementary aspects. So in terms, of, in terms of where we're going in 
trying to have this dialogue that we're having, is that we perhaps should take a look at what the Eastern systems are saying, as expounded very well by Deepak, and see if what they say really has relevance to the study of the physical universe. And I will submit to, do, to you that they do. There is a Hindu cosmology that's very, very interesting. And by the way, it is cyclic universe, which in fact may be the real universe we live in. So at that, I would leave it, and perhaps we can have a little more discussion during the discussion and answers. Thank you.